Okay, so um, we, oh man, we've got 34 people in here already. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Let me pull up my PowerPoint and share my screen. Um, let's see. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is our um, final we webinar Wednesday for January for Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and our theme today is uh, the legacy of Henrietta Lacks and the work that is uh, to be done to eradicate cervical cancer. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. We are streaming this live uh, to Facebook and uh, we will be recording it and putting it on our YouTube page. Um, feel free to turn off your camera uh, if you don't want your, your face to show on that. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the talk, um, we'll, we'll put in some pauses for, for people to ask questions um, at the end or throughout the talk. But if, if something comes up in the middle, feel free to type that into the chat box um, and we'll make sure that it gets addressed. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, you can use the comments section um, to ask any questions that you may have for our presenter today. Um, as a reminder, this is brought to you by the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Centers offers Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity. Um, and here is our team uh, today on our call. Uh, so my name is Aliyah Poulos. I'm an education outreach specialist. Uh, we have Gina Curry, who is our director for community outreach and engagement on our call today. Um, and our speaker today is actually going to be our very own Dr. Neetha Lee, who's our assistant director for community outreach and engagement. Um, Dr. Lee is a gynecologic oncologist here at the University of Chicago. She's also part of our, uh, our team at the Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity. She's a Cancer Center member. Uh, she is deeply committed to uh, her community work as much as clinical work. And so uh, we're so thrilled to have her here, have her here today uh, to share her expertise. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, Dr. Lee, if, I, uh, if you want to okay. start it up with uh, your slides. Okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you for everyone for being here. I can sort of see faces up at the top, but I think when I put my slides on, I can't see faces. So, um, and I can't quite see the chat room. So let me know if there's things. Yeah, this we'll is, monitor the chat for you, Dr. Lee. Don't yeah, about there's that. just a little bit of a different talk that we're going to do today, but I still want to share a lot of information about cervical cancer and about sort of what kind of ways that we can all um, participate in really eradicating this and in thinking through um, different aspects of how cervical cancer and any type of cancer can relate to research and kind of like ethics and patient participation. There's a lot of themes in there that I'm trying to kind of weave together. And I would love to have any in any of you guys afterwards um, have a little bit of a discussion with it too. I also talk kind of fast, so I might go through my slides quickly. We have a small video. Um, I'm not sure if there's a sense of how many people were able to see some of the videos that Aliyah had linked to, but we have a small seven minute video that's within the, within my talk as well. So let me start with my sharing my screen. I believe that, let's see, I'm going to see if that works. Are you able to um, see my slideshow or what are, what do you see right now? You see the slideshow right now. Slideshow. Perfect. Okay. You don't see all my cheat notes and everything, nope. right? Okay. Nope. Excellent. You're good. <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Neetha Lee. I'm a GYN oncologist. Um, I titled this talk with our team, The Legacy of Henrietta Lacks who many of you have heard about before, but we're gonna talk a little bit about this and how, um, how I feel like this relates to some of the work ahead that we have that's ongoing to eradicate cervical cancer and to really work towards advocacy and equity and research, which is really our mission in our office and things that Gina and Aliyah and a lot of us in our, in, in our partnerships with our community members um, really think a lot about. Um, so thank you for putting together this um, opportunity. So I have no disclosures. So who was Henrietta Lacks? Many of you may have read the book, which was called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which really brought to the forefront who her story was and who the history was. Um, this is um, a photo of her um, from the book cover, but also just another family photo of hers as well. And you can see a very elegant woman here. And so I feel like today is in honor of um, Henrietta Lacks who was a 51 year old woman from, I'm sorry, 31. Why did I say 51? I apologize. I'm missing out my things. 31 year old woman from Maryland was born in 1920. She was a wife, a mother, a sister, a cousin, a patient, a cervical cancer patient, and an African-American woman. 
And I put all of this in is because when you read the, the read the book and, and the author actually spent much time, a lot of the, it, this is from, the book is from um, the perspective of um, her daughter and her family members as well. You realize the fullness of all of our patients and the fact that sometimes we, Henrietta Lacks' name gets kind of like, reduced to something more than she was. And so I think it's always really important to acknowledge that. Really importantly, she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cervical cancer about four to five months after the birth of her son. She had five children and this was her fifth son. She had sensed that something was abnormal even before her pregnancy. And unfortunately, and very sadly, she died at age 31 from an aggressive form of cervical cancer. I'm gonna have to change my slides so that we'll see that. I don't know where I put 51. But I think what struck me when I was reading this book was the fact that when I am on service at University of Chicago and as a GYN oncologist, I continue to see young women who are very similar to Henrietta Lacks. And um, I remember being really struck that, you know, one day on our busy service, we had about four or five um, patients who were young women under the age of 50 who were dying of cervical cancer. And the way they were unfortunately passing away from this very aggressive cancer was not that different from some of the descriptions of what Henrietta Lacks went through in 1951. And it's not to dramatize it, but when you get to know your patients and you get to know their families and you get to know our own family members who may have cancer, you realize just what what a what a loss this is, and this is really um, really drives me because cervix cancer is something that we can prevent and treat early. And every time I think about this, it it um, it you know gets me on my soapbox, and it sort of also brings me to tears. <laughs> so the reason we're going to talk about HeLa and Henrietta Lacks is because of HeLa cells. We're going to show a video just shortly. But basically, when she was being treated at Johns Hopkins, which is where she, where, near where she lived, she had a tissue sample collected, partially to figure out what kind of cancer it was so that they could do a treatment, but partially also to be used in research. This was before the age of informed consent and IRBs, which are institute re review boards that really review the purpose of the research, where we have informed both verbal and written consent now. It was before people in medicine really thought about like, hey, should I ask my patient what they want to do with this? You know, like it was just before that era, yet it's still really relevant. And so I think it's important to kind of think through. The other thing that this is really important about is equitable participation in clinical trials and in research. Well, what happened to these cells, and the video describes it a little bit more, was that they became a cell line, which meant that they were actually cells that were studied and continued to be studied and were able to be kept alive in the lab and distributed and became the foundation for much scientific research and inquiry around the world, but also became you know, something that people kind of owned, right? The, 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 it was something that could be sold. It could, you know, and so it creates a lot of issues around like what that means. So um, before I get into kind of some of the tissue sides of things and the cervix things, I was thinking that we should watch this short video because I think it'll give us context. And I think um, the author is a um, woman, Rebecca Sklute, who wrote this book. And I will talk a little bit more about how or some of her sources were and the important recognition of her family as well as some of her other sources. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen then so we can share that video. Um, just as an FYI, I put in the chat box the link to our um, our Facebook Live if you want to send that to anyone who may be joining us. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take off my headphones because sometimes we have sound issues with that. If you can't hear this, um, just someone just pipe up and let me know so that we don't play the whole video with no sound. Let me make sure this is all the way up. I can hear it. Henry Lax was a, a sort of poor black tobacco farmer who grew up in Southern Virginia. And in 1951, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Um, at that point, she had moved up to Baltimore and she went to Johns Hopkins for treatment um, because it was the only place 
anywhere near her that treated black patients. So this was the era of segregation and the hospitals had the quote unquote colored wards, which was the only place that black patients or poor patients could be seen. And without telling her before treating- On the fourth floor? The doctor just- Her, I, I'm not sure. It's, um... And he sent that down the hall to George Guy, who was the head of tissue culture research at Hopkins. And George Guy had been trying to build human cells outside of the body for decades, and it had never worked. And for reasons that remain a mystery, Henrietta cells just never died. So they started doubling their numbers every 24 hours. Uh, they went from like one dish to two to four to eight to 16, and then just sort of pretty quickly took over the lab. And George Guy started calling his colleagues and saying, I think I have the first immortal human cell line, which is what they're called, which means they'll just grow and divide forever. And in response, his colleagues all said, great, can we have some? Um, because there had been this enormous effort to grow cells outside the body for a hundred years, um, because we just really didn't know a lot about cells at that point. And in response to all of his colleagues asking for them, George Guy sent them um, to anyone who wanted to use them for research. And they spread around the world this way really fast. Um, and they were one of the most important things that happened to medicine. They were used to help create the polio vaccine. They went up in first space missions to see what would happen to human cells in zero gravity. They were used to create our most important cancer medications like the Christine and Tamoxifen. Her cells were the first ever cloned. Her genes, some of the first ever mapped. Um, they were used to help develop in vitro fertilization, basically a Almost all of the vaccines we take to today can be traced back to research with her cells. There isn't a person out there who hasn't benefited from research on her cells. Uh, this is the sorry, checkers game where grandson and ad. granddad will bond. This is the kitchen. Forgot about that. The surprising tenacity of her cancer cells, which made them so important to medical research, also ultimately took her life. Henrietta Lacks died in October 1951 at the age of 31. As her cells were taken without her knowledge, in an era before the concept of informed consent existed, Henrietta died never knowing how important her cells would be. Even her family didn't learn of the true extent of her legacy until science writer Rebecca Skloot began working with Henrietta's daughter Deborah to uncover the truth almost five decades later. Rebecca, uh, she worked hand in hand uh, with my mother, Deborah Lacks. Um, they went on journeys to Clover, Virginia, uh, to talk to family members. They did a lot of work together. Uh, they hit the road a lot. They put a lot of miles on their cars. My mom was uh, two years old when Henrietta passed away. So she never knew her mother. As Deborah learned about these things, she was, there was so much, there's so much mixed emotion in it because on the one hand, look at all this incredible stuff my mother did for science and for the world. That, that gave her a level of peace with her mother's death that she had wanted her entire life. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of anger about um, the fact that everyone has benefited from these cells except her family. This information was out there for so many years and the family was not even aware of, of Henrietta's um, that they had taken cells from Henrietta Lacks and these cells have been used all over the world by scientists, labs, researchers, and millions, millions of dollars have been made and you still have the family struggling with basic health care. You know, we got to recognize the past but kind of like move forward and, and move in a positive direction to to make sure that this doesn't happen again to our family or anybody else's family. And the Lax family is making sure that we continue to move forward to honor and preserve her, her, um, her legacy and speak about her life. So they collaborated with the NIH and formed um, what's known as the Gila Genome Committee, where a few members of a Lax family and a group of scientists sit on this committee and anyone who wants to do research with the Henrietta's genome um, have to put in an application that is reviewed by members of the family and the NIH um, scientists. It was, just, it, it, it was unprecedented. There's never been a moment, a moment like that where research, quote unquote, research subjects were a part of the decision-making mechanism of science. The family now has a seat at the table. So instead of us being the last to know, we will be the first to know. 
Want to know where to invest $1,000 right now? Sorry about Hi, that. Hi, Rex Moore with The Motley Fool. And if you know us, you know how... The Immortal Life of Henry Lacks is about so many different things. It's about science and communication and how important it is for scientists to be able to communicate with the public. It's a story about journalism. What happens when people tell your story? It's, a, it, it's very much a story about race and science and race and medicine. So much of the history of science and medicine was built on the backs of black people without their knowledge. And so it's so important that Henrietta's story be told as part of that history. And in some ways that, that's the concept behind Black Lives Matter, is saying that yeah, this Black Life Matter, and it matters that we talk about it, and it matters that we tell Black stories. And look at what can happen when we try to kind of squash those stories. It has generations of impact. This year marks the 100th anniversary of Henrietta's birth and her incredible immortal cells continue to be more important than ever. With the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the HeLa cells were at the forefront of the early research which helped to shape our understanding of the virus. Within the first kind of few days of when we really realized, oh wow, this is a pandemic, this is terrifying. I started getting texts from members of Lax family saying, tell me Henrietta's got this. Like Henrietta, the HeLa cells are working on this, right? You know, and I do think that it, it says a lot about the Lax family that their first response to the pandemic from so many of them was, okay, how is HeLa de dealing with this? You know, we know she's got this. <laughs> it just makes me proud because she's not only helping a specific group of people, but she's helping everybody worldwide. She's saving lives. She's given life, so I mean, yeah, with these, I say, magical cells. When I do speaking engagements, uh, people come up to me and they say, um, I have children because of your grandmother. Um, that's a heartwarming feeling when, you know, your grandmother has died, but yet she's still providing life. So for her to know that, she is saving and impacting so many lives. Uh, she will be, she will be smiling from ear to ear. That beautiful smile, that beautiful Henrietta smile, uh, it, 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 it'll light up a room. For just $67, you can make as many videos as you want and you never need to pick up a camera or use any fancy. Sorry. Hey, I love Thank that you for sharing that. You're awesome. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's a really powerful video. It raises a lot of questions. Obviously, it's sort of a short video that compacts a lot of um, ongoing and some controversial issues. But I think it is really a good recognition video about like what we what, what we should be talking about. I'm going to share screen again and continue to talk a little bit more about um, you know what we what we what we where we go forward from this. This is just a little um, uh, little schematic of like what happens from tumor tissue um, nowadays. Tissue gets processed. Um, it goes onto a microscope. It can be preserved. It can be put into culture. Obviously, now we also sometimes you know any researchers may collect blood or fluid or feces. And the important part is the kind of the um, importance of how much we think it is important for patients and those being involved with research understanding the consent process for what exactly is happening to any tissue that gets donated and the safety mechanisms, the confidentiality, as well as the rights of any of the research uh, participants. And so I think that's just really important. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we work towards is like, you know, one of the things that um, Rebecca Sklut in this video talked about is like, how do we involve patient advocates and patient um, cancer advocates, as well as community members, and how do we best communicate results as well. So I think this is a really important model that we would love to see more and more in all of our scientific endeavors. I'm gonna switch gears though, and really talk a little bit more about the fast facts and kind of what ties me to this story as well in terms of like cervical cancer. Anyone with a cervix is at risk for cervical cancer. It's the second most common cancer death for women age 20 to 29. Mostly commonly we see women who get this cancer between the ages of 35 and 44, similar to what we saw with Henrietta Lacks. 
you're most at risk if you've not had a pap smear or no pap smear in five years. During Henrietta Lacks times, pap smears had not been invented and they had not been um, widespread. So we did we had a much higher rate of cervical cancer deaths in the United States, and this plummeted um, really dramatically since that time period. Now about 14,000 women in the United States get cervical cancer every year and about 4,200 die each year. And those 4,200 is just a, it's just a, to me like a completely missed opportunity of like so many levels of our system. We know that this is related to HBV infection. We also know that pre-cancer and early cancer can be caught and treated early and that it's preventable and treatable. So as you're listening in, I think we can think about how we use all of this information that we have. Please share it with anybody that you know, anybody who hasn't been up to date with their pap smear, encouraging them, and we'll go through some of the details. When we look worldwide, we know that cervix cancer also disproportionately affects countries that don't have a health system that has a regular screening program. So we see places in Africa, India, South America, um, Mexico, all these places that look like they have a higher rate of incidence rate, meaning so 25, greater than 25 per 100,000 women will get cervix cancer in these countries. The US over here, you're like, oh, that doesn't look so bad. Like, you know, we're kind of in this like lower tier range. And that's because we do have pap smears and we've made great strides since the 1950s in that. And so that's really important. But I think what's really important is what happens when you take a deeper level. When you look at the United States, it's not necessarily equal. You see the range where there are some states that have much lower rates of incidence of cervical cancer and some states that are much higher, eight to 10%, eight to 10 women per 100,000. Then when you look at state by state, you know that the state ranges, right? Like that's descriptive here in this map. But we also know that minority women, black women, Hispanic women have higher rates of getting cervical cancer and unfortunately higher rates of dying from cervical cancer. And this really reflects the reality, some of which like really has not changed since some of what um, Henrietta Lacks' family had experienced. And I think this is what we have to like continue to remember and push against when we're thinking about how are we gonna eradicate cervical cancer. This is all cervical cancers, and this is where women are dying of cervix cancer. This is not as common of a cancer as breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer. So we are a big push for all of the screenable cancers, but it's also really important because we have both screening and um, early detection and vaccination to be able to tackle cervix cancer. When we look at who gets cervix cancer, the higher rates, like I mentioned before, and then you can look at here, the age group is really women in their reproductive and right after their reproductive age group. So these are women who are mothers and daughters are often in that middle generation of you're taking care of your kids and you're taking care of your parents. And so the loss of these women, any lot, life lost, obviously, but the loss of these women is usually in the center of, of, of a large family. And this can be devastating for so many people um, involved with their their care and their loved ones. When we look at disparities in cervix cancer in Illinois, we see also a difference between who's dying, who's getting diagnosed with cervical cancer when you look at Hispanic women, Black women compared to white or Asian Pacific Islander women. Although I will say that the screening rates for Asian Pacific Islander are much lower, so that's a, a different type of disparity. When we look at Chicago compared to the US, we see that same type of, um, of difference. When we look at Cook County, we see that same difference. And so it's really important to kind of think about where we're going to make impact in terms of making sure we have access to screening, to appropriate follow-up and to vaccines. So you can see here, the incidence has changed. And so since Ms. Lax's death in 1951, the, dr the dramatic change in where we are now, but you can also start to see these pockets of where we're not doing well enough. I think the, some of the, I apologize, some of this is a little bit repetitive here. When we look at the Chicago Health Atlas, which goes through Chicago um, communities, um, we look at dividing communities sometimes between economic hardship with a lot of different measures. And we see that in high economic hardship communities, we see higher rates of cervical cancer. And this really mirrors some of the disparities that we're seeing, the disparities that we were not surprised, unfortunately, to see related to COVID. And they're all related to sort of this economic and um, sort of structural racism that, that exists as well in how it affects uh, our, um, our health. 
This was a chart that one of our students put together where she looked at the highest cervical cancer incidence rates in the communities and the lowest cervical cancer rates in the communities. And you can really see a striking difference between the economics, between the race of the majority com community members. And this is just really like unacceptable in terms of like the highest cervical incidence rates. And when you're looking at something like Humboldt Park or Inglewood, you're seeing rates that may be as high as 19 to 100 that per 100,000, which are comparable to some states some countries that don't have a good screening program. And that means that our system is somewhat broken. Not everybody who gets HPV is going to go on to get cervical cancer. So that's important to remember. It just means that we want to make sure that they get proper follow-up. You need to have an infection of the cervix, but it could go back and forth. But the follow-up of persistent infections is very important. One thing that I wanted to bring up here is to sort of understand the pelvic exam a little bit. One of the things we talk about is that a pelvic exam doesn't automatically mean a pap or an HPV test was done. So the pelvic exam really means the speculum, the bimanual exam, the looking. We can visualize problems. We can feel and see the cervix or the uterus. We can test separately for STIs or we can test separately for the pap and HPV. And this is really important because one of the messages that we want to get out is that not only do we need to say, oh, did I have my pap smear? We really want to say, like, did I I know my result of my pap smear? Did I really get a pap smear or did I get actually a, um, a pelvic exam that didn't actually test um, my cells? Cervical cancer screening and prevention, symptoms of cervical cancer, irregular bleeding before or after menopause, pain, irregular discharge, pelvic pain, changes in your bowel and bladder function. Those are sometimes, unfortunately, signs of a cervical cancer that may be already visible and may be further along. However, some early cancers can present that way too. We'd like to make sure that we test for cervical cancer by a pap test, which is collecting the cells, HPV testing. Generally, age 21 is when we're starting this. There's no need to start earlier than that. And some of the recommendations have changed a little bit. We say that you should stop screening at age 65, but that's if you've never had any abnormal screens and you've been screened like regularly in the past, because it's really important about 17%, 17 to 20% of women who get diagnosed with cervix cancer will happen after the age of 65. So we don't wanna miss anything either. Pap smears have a lot of different funny results that come by, and it's not like you need to memorize that, but just to know that what this reflects are the pap smears, we're trying to gauge, we scrape off the cells, and then we're trying to gauge, you know, what is, um, you know, what do these cells look normal? Do they look slightly abnormal? Are they starting to look even more concerning, such as precancer? But most abnormal pap smears are not going to go into turning into cervical cancer, and that's really important to remember. Colposcopy is a view of the cervix, so afterwards to make sure um, that we can get, take a biopsy if you have a very abnormal pap smear and follow that up. The issue with screening is that we still have a lot, we've done so well, but we haven't done well enough because we could really eradicate this. This is not a high enough number that we shouldn't stop that goal. But I think just like as people talk about the Swiss cheese effect in public health, we have these missed opportunities. We're not vaccinating everybody. We're not screening everybody. Those we screen, we may not be following them up. Those we follow up may not get appropriate rapid care. So there's a lot of different ways that we can all play our part. In this old data from 2012, it showed that 8 million women in the United States were not screened in the five, last five years. But seven out of 10 women who were not screened actually had a regular doctor and health health insurance. Oftentimes we think of one of the risk factors for cervix cancer is not getting a pap smear because you may not be insured or you may not have access or sort of access and time or you know other resources to get to screening. But even in women who had health insurance, we were under screening women. I see women in my practice all the time who have been working as, as you know, in the healthcare field or in other fields or in education, and they just didn't think it applied to them. And that's really very, very, very concerning. There's stigma associated with cervix cancer. There's other health issues that may arise, competing reasons. There's a lack of time. We're all really busy. It's uncomfortable. Nobody likes to go to, to get a pelvic exam. It's, you know, it's kind of terrible. Um, but at the same time, we know we can get it done and we know we can do it, right? Lack of knowledge, it doesn't apply to me. So many women feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm, you know, I may be older. I don't, you know, I, I'm not currently sexually active. I've been with the same partner. I've only had one partner. All of those things don't really matter. It still matters if you got your pap smear and HPV test. 
a lack of navigation to get people through the visit to the abnormal pap smear to the colposcopy is another area we're researching. And a lot of like sort of, you know, fear, embarrassment, shame, the idea of like below the belt exams is uncomfortable or people are worried about it. And there's also a concern for like anybody who's had a prior abuse or trauma situation related to sexual activity may feel particularly uncomfortable with um, exams. And so trying to kind of really break down what are the ways that we can make this better is, is a very important um, multiple ways that we can work it. As a review, 20 to 29, we want you to have a pap smear every three years. HPV testing is a little controversial, but not really until age 30 do we normally start an HPV test with your pap. Now, women who have a higher risk for cervical cancer, such as women who have HIV, who are HIV positive, women who have transplants may need to be screened more frequently and don't follow those guidelines. Also, if you've had a history of abnormals, you may not be in this guidelines again. And then, in 2020, there were some guidelines to say that maybe we should start at age 25 and use the HPV test first. And I think that's going to become more and more, um, more and more the case. But right now, it's a little bit controversial. So more of the organizations stick with 21. One of the things that's really important, and I would really encourage any of you who are on this talk to think about like talking to their, your own like friends and family, like, hey, you know, because of COVID, did you ever go get your pap smear? Did you get your mammogram? We saw this huge necessary decline in screening. This is for cervical, so colon and breast that happened in April and May, and we're not back up to normal. So the big issue is that if we don't get back up to normal, we'll start to see increasing amounts of these cancers that we were trying to catch early. And so doing our part to try to improve that is going to be really important. So estimates of missed or delayed diagnosis if current low levels of testing continued um, for the entire months ending in June. Now I will say it actually did start to go back up. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and because of the vaccine and more efforts, we're hopeful that this won't change. But there are many people who are missing out on their routine care and we don't wanna miss that quite honestly. And so this is a really important um, thing to advocate for. Now, why don't we just focus on screening? Cervix cancer and HPV is just the tip of the iceberg. With screening, um, obviously we'll get to that 13 to 14,000 cases of cervix cancer, but we won't get to um, we won't get to the other precancers. We won't get to any of the other cancers that HPV can cause, which is oropharyngeal cancer, which is black of the back of the throat, anal cancer, which I think um, is the is is anal cancer related to HPV. We've had speakers talk about both of those things, as well as vulvar vas vaginal and penile cancers. And so this is just really important to think through like all of the things that we would be able to prevent with vaccine. It's a public health problem. It's very common. There should not be stigma about it, but there still is, which is really annoying because it keeps people from seeking care. Not annoying, but it's understandable, but annoying, I guess. Um, seeking care. I'm not going to go over too much of that, but HPV is transmitted skin to skin. There's hundreds of types of HPV, but the, the ones that are specific to the genital area can cause skin to skin transmission. It's considered a sexually transmitted disease because of that skin to skin transmission. But I do have mixed feelings about this classification because I think it brings in stigma to the conversation, which we don't really want because it is so common. 80 to 90% of all of us will have HPV at some point in our life. It's a common cold. So vaccine is available. It's a cancer prevention vaccine. Ideally, we wanna shoot for getting this to our children between age 11 and 12. You can do it as young as nine, but really importantly, it's actually approved up until age 45. The big push is nine to 26, but if you haven't gotten the vaccine yet and you're under the age of 45, this is actually still available and recommended that you talk to your doctor and see if this makes sense for you. And we have a lot of data that I can go on and on about, about safety and efficacy. We're really excited that there have been actually now um, evidence that we can see um, that, I'm gonna skip through some of these so we can have more of a conversation, um, evidence that this is starting to actually change the nut rates of cervical cancer. So the main message for cervix cancer is prevention and early detection, quite honestly. Again, so that we're not having these like multiple missed opportunities and these failures that we're still seeing. I'm gonna um, 
switched gears a little bit and talk about sort of um, this, you know, the Henrietta Lack story and how this kind of related. One of the things that I was thought was very interesting that I had not learned about until I started to like look into this more was um, about a um, physician named Dr. Roland Anthony uh, Patillo. He's the only African American who was studying at Johns Hopkins and he also was a science, re science researcher in the field of OBGYN and GYN oncology. And he was actually, um, you know, continued to have his interest when he opened up a lab at more House School of Medicine. He actually continued to work with HeLa cells, as did people around the country, but he paired this with a very, um, you know, personal relationship and compassion for the Lacks family that asked, that, that you know, really drove him to reach out and become acquainted with them and really become a patient, an advocate for their family. He, in 1996, he began to host a women's health conference at Morehouse School of Medicine in honor of Henrietta Lacks, where he would invite members of the family and would kind of discuss um, some of these issues well before the book came out too. So I'm so happy that the book came out, but I do think it's important to recognize what Dr. Patillo is doing um, before this, you know, before, before it became famous. In 2016, the Gila Women's Health Conference debuted um, and celebrated their 20th year. Since then, Johns Hopkins also has created a very extensive um, patient advocacy program that centers around the Lacks family and also do a annual um, scientific research meeting that involves community and, um, and family members as well as scientists. And so I think it's really important to think about you know, we all are, are are people that may want to participate in research, but what is that give and take and how do we respect all of our, our participation and the participation of our patients is really important as well. So the Henrietta Lacks Foundation was established in 2010, and it's actually a community advocacy organization as well. And it has awarded over 80 grants to nearly 30 qualifying members of, of Henrietta Lacks extended family, which includes grants for healthcare, dental assistance, tuition, job training, employment, and emergency relief. They also award grants to member family members of the survivors of the Tuskegee syphilis studies, as well as other studies that may be related to some studies that were not ethical and were not appropriate that were done many, many years ago. Go, as well as really standing for a voice for like making sure that we're thinking about these talk these topics when we're planning our research and we, that we bring these things to to you know to bear when we're thinking about new new discoveries new consent forms new types of research. One of the other things that the video mentioned was this idea of the HeLa Genomic Committee at the NIH, which is really breaking down barriers between patients, researchers, participants. The requests for any use of the HeLa cell genome is really reviewed by a working group that consists of scientists, a bioethicist, as well as members of the Lacks family. In addition, anytime those cells and that genomic data is used, their um, uh, Henrietta Lacks is acknowledged in terms of their contribution. Um, there was a new um, act and policy advocacy that was um, passed, which was the Henrietta Lacks Enhancing um, Cancer Research Act, which passed in December of 2020. And this was actually focused on looking at equity in clinical trials participation to make sure that minority participation is supported, to understand barriers to minority participation that may be both um, in terms of like fear, historical barriers, racism of impl implicit and explicit bias, as well as financial barriers. So this is a really important acknowledgement of, of how, much, um, how much we need to continue to do. So I'm going to start to end here in terms of thinking about what can you do, get screened, encourage others to keep their screening up to date, ask for PAPs and HPV, and also find out what your results were. I think that's really important. I, I, I realize that I have to change my slide, get vaccine if less than 26, less than 45. I don't want this to be published. I'm going to have to change this right now. Get children, boys, and girls vaccinated, which is really important. Um, the rates of men getting oral pharyngeal back of the throat cancers is actually rising to be equivalent to what women are getting cervical cancers. Everyone and anyone with it can be an advocate about this topic, cancer survivors, those affected by HPV related conditions, healthcare providers, any of our employees who are here on this, on this call or any community members, caregivers. We all have sort of a unique perspective that we'll take from this story. And I think I want to recruit more people to be able to share this message. Advocate on the level that you feel comfortable, one-on-one -on -one discussions, share with trusted friends and family, in person, community forums. Obviously this has changed because we're doing things remotely. Um, obviously be careful with any of your sources if you're using social media. 
This is a patient of mine um, who actually, after her cervical cancer diagnosis and kind of a lot of, of, of soul searching and kind of growth that she did, she actually um, petitioned the governor and had the official January in 2016, had it declared cervical cancer month in Illinois where it hadn't been before. And she actually leaves, she knits these things and she leaves these like tiny cards all over the place in grocery stores, it used to be in movie theaters and all these places. And it's just a little recognition of like cervical cancer screening and has some information. So I was just thinking about the impact that you can make in different ways. So advocacy can be community, healthcare advocacy through healthcare systems change, political advocacy. Obviously our office is involved with a lot of policies. The policy that we advocated for this year was really supporting the Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Program, which is a program that supports uninsured or underinsured women to get free cervical and breast cancer screening, navigation and treatment. That's really an important resource research advocacy, so fundraising, keeping research patient-centered and making sure we're telling people what we found, and then self-advocacy, which starts with making sure we're being honest with ourselves if we're up to date with our own screening. So if you're at work and you wanna get involved, give us a call, your unit, um, you know, local advocacy organizations, um, the HPV Roundtable has a lot of resources. We're, also, we're always happy to plug anybody in who's interested in any of this type of work um, and would love to share, um, share more about that. So, all right, I'm done. So any thoughts or questions or what, what, what are people thinking here? Um, Dr. Lee, I have a question that came in uh, to me through the chat box. Um, it said, if a person who is 72 and had a hysterectomy, uh, normally no pap smear is performed, are they at risk then for cervical cancer? That's a good question. They're not at risk for cervical cancer. If the hysterectomy had been performed, for example, for abnormal cervical precancer cells or cervical cancer, then they may be somebody who gets their pap, continues their pap. I think the important thing, if somebody's had a hysterectomy, it's a little bit different because they don't have a cervix anymore. But if they've had, they, they really don't know, for example, like I have no idea what my screening history was. I haven't seen a doctor. The doctor will talk to you to decide, like, do you really need that? What was your history like before? And how long ago was your pap? So we do sometimes do pap smears of the vagina in select patients, but at 72, it would really depend on like why you had your hysterectomy, how long ago that was, and if there were any abnormal findings on your exam. Great, thank you for that. Um, any other questions for Dr. Lee? You can use the chat box or feel free to just unmute yourself. And um, I'm gonna be monitoring the Facebook Live as well, just to make sure that we don't, don't have any comments or, or questions coming in the comments box there. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, was that, so the, you talked about how um, one of your colleagues, you know, would put the, the knit cervical cancer yeah. uh, ribbons. Was that Sherlanda, is that? No, no, no. This was um, this was um, our patient um, who was involved with Survivor. I don't oh, think okay. that her, her name is Paulette, and she became okay. a sort of a, a a more local and national advocate in terms of like the some of the work and the speaking that she would do. Uh, so, um, and I, I only ask that because Sherlanda was a, a patient services representative yes. that um, joined us last year for for a yes. community and talk. And she emailed me this year, and I was so disorganized I could not. It's my fault mm -hmm. that she's not here talking. Oh today. no, no! I just one of the things that I love though, because you know, a lot of times, and this is a, this is a theme that kind of comes up a lot on these webinars. It's like, well, I'm one person. Like, what am I going to do? And one one of the things I loved is that she said every January she would paint her nails bright teal and wear teal earrings and wear, you know, something teal every day. And so it's until people asked her, why, why are you dressed like that? Why are your nails bright teal? And then she goes, oh, great. So she'd use that as like a conversation point for, um, for talking about cervical cancer and why, you know, getting your pap is so important and use that as like a jumping off point to tell people about the HPV vaccine. And she's like, you know, in my own little way, I'm reaching people just directly sure. that I come into contact with. Like my family members, my daughter will say, why, why would you paint your nail that bright color? And then that has like a starting point for a conversation. And I just loved that idea of how you can take these individual actions that seem, you know, to you maybe on a small scale, but um, you can actually reach people that way in some of, you know, just in doing some of those small scale things. So 
you know, we like to think about those ways. I totally agree. And I think it's really important to think about how much, like, who do we go to when we're like thinking about like, you know, how we're going to get care, if we're going to get care, what are we going to do if something doesn't feel right? Or what are we going to do? I mean, this came up as we're talking about COVID vaccine, right? Like a lot of the conversation was like, did you get the vaccine? How did you feel? I did get the vaccine, by the way, and it was totally fine. Um, But so I think that personal connection is really important. Agreed. We have a comment here. Someone said that they read the Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks book and it was excellent. Um, and we are hopefully, we think in the fall, probably going to yeah. launch our, our book club around Henrietta Lacks just so we give people enough time to, to read It's that. a little bit of a dense book, but I really did enjoy it as well. I thought it, was, it, it brought up a lot of really excellent points. Um, and there is also, a, you know, f- uh, for people who want to cheat, there is also a great movie um, about uh, that's based on the book as well. And that's on um, HBO Max. I believe you can find that and stream that there. Um, do we have any other any other questions for for Dr. Lee? Oh, I got one in the I just got one in the comments, uh, the chat box here. It says, uh, is there evidence that the vaccine reduces risk of cervical cancer in addition to infections for women age 30 plus? That data is probably a little bit older. I mean, sorry, like newer data because the original vaccines were really only approved for nine to 26. And so when you think about the the, the, the older data, when countries first started to c- capture that data, they followed that group of, of kids that basically had the v- vaccine. So we just don't have that long-term follow-up because people weren't over 26 getting consistent consistently vaccinated until more recently, but I think that we are going to see that as well. Um, And then there's a question here. Um, Let's see, what is the benefit to those getting regular pap spears? Of the HPV vaccine? Is that what uh, you said? What is what is the benefit to those who get to people for people getting regular pap smears? That's what the question. Yeah, the said. big benefit is the fact that we could, you know, we could find any early type of precancer that either may not need treatment but could get follow up, or could find a precancer that could be easily treated with like a very minor procedure. And in some few cases, we'll find early cancers that can be treated with a little bit more of a surgery, perhaps, but not can avoid avoid chemotherapy or radiation if possible. So I think the benefit of the screening is being able to find things before anybody has any symptoms. And that's, I think, a really important part of of being able to kind of catch cancers earlier or catch precancers. Any other questions? Thank you for that, Dr. Lee. Any other questions? I had a quick question and I want to make sure I answered it correctly. So I'm not going to tell you what I answered, but I just will listen to your answer. Okay, I was asked that we know that the pap smear is like the best way to um, check for HPV, but that means that there's nothing for boys. They just get the- You're right. There is not a test to check for, I mean, you technically could, if there was a, if there was something that somebody had in their general area that was a growth or something like that, they can get that tested for HPV. But in general, most men are asymptomatic, so they don't actually usually have symptoms. But if there was something that was like a, you know, a concern, they could get tested that way. But most boys don't, or, or men don't get any testing for HPV. And there's currently not an HPV test for like, or oral cancers or anal cancers. For high risk patients, we do do pap smears of the anal canal. And that's in a little bit of a different patient population that may be at higher risk. And we use sort of similar ideas of treatment for that too. I answered it correctly. It's Dr. Shogun, I think he yeah. kind of went over that a little bit last yeah. week. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it's really important. We see a lot of that as well. So great. Any other questions? for Dr. Lee before we move into the session evaluation um, and some of our raffle prizes. Any other questions for Dr. Lee? Okay then, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for as always for sharing your expertise and just being such a fierce advocate uh, for all things community and all things cervical cancer. You were the perfect uh, speaker to round out our series here. So thank you so, so much please, for that. So please, if there's anybody who wants to do any more or if there's other places that you want, um, I'm sure um, Ali is going to go over this. If there's more places that we want to share this type of information, um, please do let us know. We have a lot of um, a lot of us who really want to make sure that we get more of this information out and really give um, 
give the information to um, all of the participants who I suspect are kind of leaders in their own circle of work and community. So, so please let us know if there's something that we can get you resource wise to help that too. Absolutely. And so, and just as a note on some resources, we've, so um, all of you should be getting the PAP Rally Friday emails because I have your email address. So um, we will be spending our last one out and we'll make sure that we include sort of a summary of all, uh, we link to a bunch of resources in those emails, but we'll compile them all for the last one, just to make sure that you, um, you know, have all, all the resources necessary to make sure that you can have these conversations with people in your personal and professional circles.